original super fun and all about artisan cheese and more to melt your peaceful heart and toast your peaceful life. Coming to you from the Appalachian Mountains of southwestern Virginia, this is the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hey, this is Scott Hall from Peaceful Heart Farm, and you are listening to the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hello, 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 everybody. Melanie Hall here. I hope you're doing very, very well. The conversation today and every day revolves around the value of tradition, traditional food prep and storage, traditional cooking, and of course, traditional artisan cheese. Topics discussed here are designed to create new perspectives and possibilities for ad, for how to add the taste of tradition to your life. In today's show, I will as usual, give you some homestead life updates. And then I'm going to talk about what does it mean to, quote, get in touch with the land. And then we'll finish up with a grilled cheese sandwich recipe. All right, first of all, homestead life updates. Retraining the cows is the first item on the agenda. Uh, Now that spring is approaching, we are preparing to begin the milking cycle once again. I am excited. I can't wait. Milking the cows is one of the greatest pleasures of our homestead life for me. Now, every fall, we stop milking the cows. And that causes the cow's milk to dry up. And uh, this step in husbanding our animals is important. We want to make sure that each cow has the energy resources that she needs to feed her developing calf. So for the last few months of her pregnancy, she's not producing extra milk. After she has her calf, she has lots and lots of milk, more than her calf needs, and that's when our milking process begins. Now, before that date, it's important to get the cows back into the habit of walking to the milking shed every day, and they need to be reacquainted with that process. So to fulfill that need, we've started walking them up to the milking shed every day, and it's it's gone pretty well so far. Um, they get there just fine and they get back just fine Um, it's the part that comes in between that we will be working on diligently for the next week or so it's been quite a while since they've actually been inside the milking shed and there are some unfamiliar aspects to it now and uh, then there are some of them that have never been in the milking shed and we'll get them there with a little practice we work just a little bit at a time bring them up Uh, tempt them with a little sweet feed and uh, work with them in a non-threatening manner and eventually they'll just walk right on in there. Now last year we erected a newer version of a temporary milking shed that we used the previous year. Um, We set the old the very old one up two years ago Um, there, we set it up in the only flat place that was nearby the corral that we could use to bring all the cows down together and keep them contained. Um, Scott even ran power out there for that. Unfortunately, the the corral area is also a lowland area and a, a lot of rainwater flows through there. Um, it's not really a problem if you only use it occasionally on dry days, um, but twice a day milking is a different story. We were trudging through mud all the time um the there was a temporary floor in that shed and it was it was a few sheets of plywood and that was fine but it was fine as long as you didn't step off the plywood everything around the area was mud and it was made deep mud by the weight of those cows coming across there every day so last year scott moved this it's a shelter logic shed in a box structure he moved it to a higher ground and he made a little small animal loafing area to hold the cows uh, while two of them would be in the shed milking and the rest of them just kind of loafing around outside it was level and he, he made he made sure that the water would flow around it and we didn't need the plywood floor it was just dirt or so we thought there's always a lesson when we're using temporary structures i mean after all we evolved our permanent structures based on each previous need so a few days ago um, scott poured a concrete pad under that shelter Um, it took him a day 
of very hard work and it's beautiful and it will serve us well this season. But why did we need it? Last year, we milked one cow. This year, we will be milking five. And here are the basics of how that works. Under the shed, there are two spaces for cows to be milked. They walk in, they put their heads into a stanchion. We secure their heads, which keeps us all safe during the milking process. And then the milk cow gets two handfuls of a sweet treat during the milking season to keep that keeps their health at a maximum while they're producing lots of milk. And once they finish that, then they start working on the hay. Everybody stays calm and content. Once the milking is done, they return to the rest of the herd hanging out in a small pen just outside. So why did we need the concrete pad? Well, one of the lovely things about having animals is their freedom to express themselves at any time and anywhere. The sheer amount of feces and urine from five cows on that dirt floor would be overwhelming. The way it worked last year was that we might go days without one of the cows practicing the eliminating of waste with abandon. But then again, it might happen day after day, twice a day. We were putting down large amounts of lime. Uh, so the concrete pad. Well, while it was taking a day away from Scott's working on the creamery, it was well worth the investment. Because I just can't imagine the mess that five cows would have made had we done it the same way as last year when we only had two in there. We were only milking one, but there's always two at a time in the shed so that they're comfortable. They're herd animals. They need company. The concrete pad, slightly slanted, and Scott, being the genius that he is, also made sure of a path for washing away the mess. Um, I feel blessed, and I can't wait to give it a go. Last year, I had to balance my stool on tree roots, <laughs> so I was always kind of sitting cockeyed. All right, let's talk about some of the other animals. Uh, we got no news on when the birth of the first calf might be. Uh, we're watching and watching and watching, and there has been uh, no real indication yet that anything has changed in that realm. And uh, a little bit of other animal news. The two young goat kids, they spend a great deal of time outside of the fence. Uh, we don't worry about that because they just go back in as needed but they're goats and they're just going to go outside the fence if they can um the flock of sheep the herd of goats and two donkeys moved into the garden area to graze the grass down before the garden gets going uh, they're not allowed in there once the garden gets going so we wanted to get that grass grazed down and as far as the garden we took the plastic covers off of all the raised beds today yay i can plant well as soon as it warms up just a little bit more we're right on the edge. I'm ready. Uh, the plants I have started inside, they're ready. Yeah, come on, weather, get with it. And that brings me to the topic of the day. What does it mean to get in touch with the land? And the first thing I want to talk about is the movement of the seasons. The extremes of the summer and winter solstice and the balance in the middle with the spring and fall equinox. You know, the force of nature is immense. Though the universe is, is immense. Everything about our world outside the shelter of our homes is untamable and works on its own schedule. Let's take a look at this past winter. It has been a long and hard winter, not just for us, but for many throughout the country. Major snow, deep cold, and now the flooding accompanying the interminable rains here in the southwest virginia we've been blessed with the first dry spell since august last year it's the first time since august that we haven't had rain each and every week sometimes torrential rains for days on end heck we had to alter the pathway we bring the cows to the barn their usual pathway went through the creek bed only the creek bed has been flooded countless times since last summer. And with 7,000 pound cows trudging through it day after day to get water, it became a quagmire of mud. 
So bringing them back and forth twice a day for milking, that looked like a nightmare in the making. So we altered the path that we bring, bring them up, at least until it dries out. And yay, it's dry. We have been blessed with a week of dry weather. And it's not something we had any control over. And we are grateful for the break. I know many in the Plain States continue to suffer the ravages of the weather flooding their lands. Why would anyone want to do this on purpose? You know it's going to happen. Why would anyone do this knowing that nature was going to slap us hard from time to time? I can answer in five words. It makes us feel alive. It's all about life and death and the continuous cycle of the seasons. The continuous cycle of death and rebirth that gives us a deep appreciation for the life we have as well as the gifts of our family. We appreciate the gifts of our plants and animals. The seasons move on a rhythm and winter flowed towards spring. I commonly experience what is known as seasonal affective disorder. Some of you may be familiar with that. It's a type of low grade, sometimes high grade depression um, that happens during the winter. And for me, it usually begins sometime in January. For others, it can start as early as the late fall, even before the winter solstice, the shortest day of the year, the depths of darkness. So the, the season of winter is a time of everything shutting down and outside the world becomes more immobile. The, the animals cluster together, water freezes, um, trees spend their time growing underground where the temperature is stable. Above ground, they look dead. And as the winter wears on, I and others like me become more lethargic, less active, quite dull. Um, no real purpose, no get up and go. And this is an inner experience that I'm describing because outwardly life goes on. Tasks are completed, if more slowly. Stuff gets done because, after all, the globe is still spinning on its axis, axis and, and time keeps going. But... As it goes on and on, each day I would feel a heavier load pressing down on me. Um, now this year, my perspective was different. I could still feel it. But I'm here in touch with the land, and I think it made a difference. Even though I could feel the pressure of hunkering down for winter, it was not. I, I was not quite as profoundly affected by it. And the day it changed was profound. I woke up on Thursday morning, the day after the vernal equinox, and I felt great. For no particular reason, I felt great. And I knew it was over. Winter is over. Now, the winds are blowing very strongly today on a day cooler than normal for this time of year. It doesn't matter. My heart and soul know that the time of hibernation is over. Spring is here. Now, I don't really know what it's like for others that live farther south, you know, where the trees and flowers have been blooming for a week or two or more. I don't know. Did they feel it? Did they feel that heaviness, that uh, that winterness? Did they feel it all the way up to the first day of spring? I don't know. What, what's it like for those farther north, still in the depths of frozen snow and ice? Did they feel it? You know, even though they may not see it for weeks, do they feel it? Spring. And truth, even here, we have a week or two before we can expect truly sp spring light weather where we can really get out in the car garden and go great guns. Uh, we could easily get another snow sometime in the next two or three weeks. But it doesn't matter. The globe has turned in its endless journey around the sun. So the moment when the center of the sun is directly above the equator is past. The hours of daylight continue to lengthen. The daffodils are blooming. Our peach, plum, and cherry trees are blooming in the orchard. We've started the journey towards summer. So what about summer? At the peak of summer, our tolerance for the heat has likely begun to wane a little bit. The, the extreme of 
the summer solstice will now take its toll. Will we get enough rain? Even though we were flooded for months and months last year and throughout the winter, will we need rain during the summer to keep our animals and crops hydrated? You know, the cycle of life and death is there in every season. This is what it means to be in touch with the land. We're close to life and we're close to death every day. We are reminded daily of the wonder of life and the fragility of life. Isn't that what we're all looking for? That connection with the natural cycle of life and death and the wonder that is creation? I strive to be filled with awe in every waking moment. It's pretty easy in spring, summer, and fall. Not so much in the winter for me. Now, sure, I get distracted by Twitter and Facebook and the latest cooking gadget. You know, these are these are great things. They've made our life easier. Um, each invention throughout history, it came to, to fulfill a need to help us with some of the the death and the aspects of life, the disasters. The each one brings with it, with it the opportunity to make life easier and safer or more uniform. So today in the U.S., even the lowliest person has a better chance of surviving to old age than the average person of 100 years ago. In the early 1900s, disease was still rampant and modern medicine was in its infancy. The nationwide transportation system had yet to be built. People were closer to their food source by necessity. Now we ship it all the way across the country. But back then, you just couldn't get fresh food as far across the country as, as today. It wouldn't be; it would no longer be fresh. All of that changed rapidly throughout the 1900s. And the more we got mechanized, the less we had to worry about the fickleness of Mother Nature and the cycles of the calendar. And the more distance we placed between ourselves and death. The more insulation we had. From death. You know, nature's hard, nature's ruthless. Being in touch with the land and living close to that knowledge gives me the sense of my place in the world. I am such a small speck in the larger planet and the universe. And isn't that what it means to get in touch with nature? Isn't that what we seek? When the facts of death are thrown in our face daily, it gives us the deepest respect for life. Our tiny little life in this great cosmos. We know that we are alive. We are grateful to be alive. Obsession with our creature comforts and, and this small personal issues, they, the, they become small and petty. Because we're focused on something much greater than ourselves. We see that much, something much greater than ourselves in action every day. And it's taking that thought into the activities of our daily lives that makes the difference. And you can do it too. Even without living on the homestead. You know, we spend a lot of time creating food here. And in that process, we experience a great deal of love for our animals. And we put in a lot of work hours to, into supporting them. We care for their lives. Now, these are domesticated animals. Their lives are in our hands. You know, we work hard for them. The, the amount of effort we put into providing the best possible environment for them is worth the effort that we put forth. Our investment of blood, sweat, and tears is what makes us all more human. As we share our stories, the opportunity for you or anyone else to participate abounds. You don't have to be the one putting in uh, the effort required to make it all work, but you can be the one that supports the ideal of nurturing ourselves via nurtured plants and animals. I mean, it doesn't have to be all factory farming and monocropping. Your support of the local farmers in your area brings a little bit of peace to the world. 
Sometimes we feel like we don't make a difference. But it's, it's really easy to change that. It's easy to teach your kids to know they make a difference in the world. No matter how small a speck you are in the world, you can connect with your local farmers. Visit their farms when they offer tours. Make sure your kids can play in the dirt of a farm garden. Let them pet the little smaller animals and they can watch with awe from a safe distance the larger animals grazing peacefully. Let your children know that these are not just beautiful plants and animals, but the sustenance that keeps us all alive. What an awesome responsibility we have in caring for our plants and animals so they may feed and, and take care of us. Keep your ears peeled for when we offer farm tours. It's coming. We're, we're all just small specks in the enormity of the universe and we're all integral specks in the creation and maintenance of it all. Anyway, I just went on waxing poetically there. Let's get down to brass tacks and talk about today's recipe. How about an ooey gooey grilled cheese sandwich? So if you're if if you're enjoying cheese, I can think of no better way than melt it on some toasted bread, toasted bread slathered with butter. And a grilled cheese sandwich, it's simple to make, but improvements can always be made. This recipe will give you the confidence to make your grilled cheese sandwich spectacular. And here are some tips for making that perfect grilled cheese sandwich. So tip number one, use really great bread. I have some great bread recipes that will be coming along shortly. Uh, for now, you might want to visit your local farmer's market. I don't think I've seen one in a long time that didn't have some local lady making some awesome bread. You can experiment with whole grain varieties, sourdough, even pumpernickel. Experiment to your heart's content. Just make sure that it's not sliced too thick and doesn't have a lot of holes. Otherwise, you either don't have enough cheese to bread ratio or your cheese leaks out. Yikes! All right, tip number two. Using butter is great, but have you tried mayo? Uh, usually we use butter on the outsides for sure, and sometimes we butter the insides as well. But what if we used mayo on the outside and butter on the inside, or vice versa? So mayo is, mayo is basically oil, eggs, and a splash of vinegar. So the oil browns the bread really nicely when it's used on the outside, and that vinegar is going to add a nice little bit of tang. And you can use it on the inside as well. All right, tip, tip number three. Use the right cheese. So, American cheese, well, that melts really well, but man, oh man, is it boring compared to other cheeses. So, you, you definitely want a cheese that melts well. Just about any aged cheese will work, with the exception of really hard cheeses like Parmesan. So, uh, Gouda, Cheddar, Gruyere, Fontana, so on. Also, you want to look for the availability of our Claude Deville aged cheddar. Uh, the Ararat Legend washed curd cheese, and the Pinnacle Alpine style cheeses this summer at the Farmer's Market in Withville. Tip number four, cook it slow. Keep the heat in the medium to medium low range. You want the bread to toast at the same rate the cheese melts. You definitely don't want to burn the bread before the cheese is fully melted. Also, press it firmly with a spatula. You, you can even put a heavy pan on top of it while it cooks. That pressure is going to give you that super crispy crust. All right, so what are you going to need? You need about a third of a cup or three ounces of cheese per sandwich. Sliced or grated. Grated is going to melt a lot quicker. Uh, two slices of bread per sandwich, a tablespoon of butter per sandwich, and a tablespoon of mayo per sandwich. All right. So you're going to put the butter or the mayo on one side of the bread, flip it over, put the butter and the mayo on the other side, then you put that on your plate, uh, put the cheese on top, add the butter and mayo in the same way on the second slice of bed, lay that on top, and then you repeat till you have all the uh, sandwiches assembled. Heat your grill or frying pan to medium low. You can raise the temperature to medium if your cheese is, is, is melting rapidly enough. All right, 
Place the sandwiches in the pan, grill until lightly browned, and then you flip it over. Continue grilling until the cheese is melted and the bread is brown on the second side. And remember, press down with a spatula um, or a pan, put a pan on there to get a crispy, like panini bread crust. crust. All right, final thoughts. No matter the size of your household, you can get in touch with the land. From container gardens of herbs on your balcony to a full-blown backyard garden. Uh, from great relationships with your family and pets to a backyard chicken coop and goat pen, there are opportunities to view nature in all of her glory. Take the time to just gaze with awe and remember how small we are in the larger scheme of things. Use that awe to inspire you to do something for someone else. Use random acts of kindness to show appreciation for the wonder of life that exists all around us every day. All we have to do is look. I hope you'll take the time to enjoy that grilled cheese sandwich with close friends and family. You'll find the recipe on our website, www.peacefulheartfarm.com, www.peacefulheartfarm.com. Uh, sign up for our email list. I send out a newsletter each week. It's got easy links to the recipes and included, you're going to get a link to the latest podcast. And you'll also find links to articles about cheese in the news. Remember, getting in touch with the land by making a huge investment in a homestead is not required. Simply get in touch with someone who is in touch with the land. Listen to their story. Embrace their story. Live vicariously through them. It's great. Make their story your own via your friendship and your patronage of their uh, farm products. Understand what it takes to be close to the land. Understand the immensity of nature. Your farmer will share that with you. In that sharing lies your connection to the land. As always, I'm here to help you taste the traditional touch. Thank you so much for listening and until next time, may God fill your life with grace and peace.